What's up, church? Good morning. Hey, let's give Jonathan and Tukey some love. It's hard to get on the stage for the first time. Yeah. Cass, uh, Lewis Cass again. Let's give them a round of applause. Sectional, regional, and sectional champions. Come on now. That's a pretty big deal. Anytime you get to cut down the nets, that's a pretty exciting time. And this is Indiana, so that, that's like a major accomplishment, right? That's awesome. So congratulations, guys, and conti continue to cheer them on. Uh, my name is Nathan, and like Tukey and Jonathan said, we are in week six in the final, final week of One Heart Series. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Anybody enjoy it this series? I have. So if you haven't been with us, let me catch you up. We're, we want to be a church of one heart, uh, of one mind. What we mean by that is we want to be a church united, heading in the same direction. So there's some, a couple things we want to do. We want to help people find Jesus. And we want to invite people to find Jesus with us. And we want to live like Jesus. And one thing to live like Jesus, we want to love like Jesus. And then we believe by this principle that we is better than me. That community, life is better in community. That we can do far more together than we can do apart. Last week, a couple weeks so we looked at insecurity, that we don't want our insecurities to stop us, that God has designed us, and he doesn't need a victor, he needs a vessel. And then last week we talked about chasing the lion, stepping up to find out what God wants to do in our lives. And today we're going to end this series, we're going to end this entire series, we're going to continue to look at something, and it's going to be, I'm going to be honest, I might get up in your grill just a little bit today, so if you're visiting for the first time, I'm sorry, we welcome you, it's awesome to be here, I'm not going to get in your grill, but Mike Barron, I'm going to get in your grill today, right up here, right, but it, it's going to be a good conversation, and kind of a, a warning call, like kind of like, what happens if we kind of miss this point, because here's my desire, and here's what I know what happens in, in churches, we have these series, and we can come up with like one phrase, like one heart, and it's cool, and it'll stick for a little while, but then we kind of forget about it. And so I don't want One Heart to be one of those series that we just forget about and I have to talk about the same things in three years. I want One Heart to become our heartbeat of a DNA of who we are. So constantly kind of pursuing the, these things. But today I want to start by having you do something for me. I want you to remember way back in the day when you learned how to swim. All right, I want you to think about that. So take a second. Think about the time you learned to swim. For some of you, that was 10 years ago. Some of you, 15 years ago. 20 years ago. 25 years ago. 30 years ago. Let me look around here. 40 years ago. Definitely 40 years ago. 50, 60, 70, 80. And I'll just cover 90 just in case. 90 years ago, all right? Not, I want you to think about that. Because I remember that day very, very vividly. It was one of those memories, like I talked about last week, that I have with my dad. And so whenever I have dad memories, they're awesome. But you know something traumatic happened a lot of times. Um, so I remember that day. And I remember uh, I was older than this. But, but learning how to swim is like... A, that's a big milestone in life. So I remember that I, I knew how to swim a little bit, but I wasn't comfortable leaving the shallow end. And so like when we go on vacation, I wanted to be able to, or if we went to water park, I wanted to be able to go to the deep end of the pool. You know why? Because at the deep end of the pool, some cool things happened. One, there were the water slides. There were diving boards. And even at a young age, I realized very quickly, all the cute girls were in the deep end of the pool. And all the boys the cute girls wanted to be with were at the deep end of the pool. And that is where I wanted to be. The only problem was I couldn't swim. Right? And so I told my dad. He's like, hey, dad, I want to move from the shallows to the deep. I want you to remember this idea, moving from the shallows to the deep. I said, dad, I want to go to, I want to learn how to swim. And I should have known right away, right away I should have known. That was a mistake. His eyes got big, and he put a big smile on his face, and I should have known right there, this was going to be a bad choice on Nathan's part. Because you know what he did? He ripped those floaties off my arm. He probably stabbed them with a knife. He says, we're no, never going back. Right away, I, I said, I want to learn how to swim. He's like, no, you're learning how to swim right now. And so he took me, to, brought me to the deep end, and he could still touch, right? I could not touch. And he's like, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to do this with your arms, do this with your legs, and, and this is how you swim. And he's like, you got it? He's like, I got it. And then he let me go. Boom. Right? Basically just threw me back in the water. And I, he's like, kick. I can hear him kicking and screaming. And kicking. And he, I'm trying to scream. He's like, kick. Swim. Right? You know, move your arms. And he picks me up. He's like, you all right? No, I'm not all right. I'm about drowned. Like, I just want to learn how to swim, Dad. And he's like, you know, you got to do this. You got to do this. Easy for you to say. You're not inhaling chlorine water, right? Your eyes aren't burning. Easy for you to say. But here's what he was telling me. Trust the process. I want to talk about that. Trust the process. 
I'm a process guy. Anybody love the process? Come on now. Anybody love it? Like, I love it. I, I, love, I love the journey. Like, you know what I mean? To get to the destination sometimes. I love that part. I'm the, I'm the weird person who, like, I enjoy the 14-hour car rides because I get to see new things. I know you guys think I'm crazy, but I like the process. And in, in life, here's what I'll tell you. If you don't like the process, you should because the process is what leads you to the destination you want to be, where you want to get. So there's a process in faith. Uh, you start somewhere and the steps happen and you, you grow deeper. In your marriage, there's a process of becoming a stronger couple. There's a process of, of finding success in life. There's a process to becoming successful in sports. There's a process before you get to a regional championship. There's a process. There's practice. There, there's workouts. There's summer workouts. There, there's all these things. There's a process. The process is the grind. The process is, is the, it kind of gets a little gritty. There's the hard work. There's the sweat. Yet, but there's a process. Well, swimming the same way, because in the process of swimming, you learn to leave the shallow end and get to the deeper end. That's the same with life. In the process, you learn to leave the basics, the status quo, the surface level, and you get a little deeper. So we're in the, we're in the deep end of the pool. I'm trying to learn how to swim. He's telling me to do all these things. My eyes at this point are, are like bloodshot red, burning because of the chlorine. I have a hoarse throat because I've swallowed so much water, I think I'm good for the rest of my life, right? But guess what I learned how to do in that vacation, that trip? I learned how to swim. Now, my, Whitney tells me I cannot do that to Natalie, right? So I, I got to pair a little differently. But I remember that process. And in, in your life, and here, here's why this matters. I don't know you all. I don't know all the faces. I don't know all the stories. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bet that you came in here today and then somewhere in your life, you want something deeper. You want something better. Now, it, it could be like, hey, I want, I want my marriage to grow. I want a deeper marriage. I want to know my partner better. I want to truly love them. I want to honor them. I want to be a marriage that's going to make it. I, I want to I grow deeper in my marriage. I want to go, grow deeper in my career. Now, you may not say like in those terms, but you're like, hey, I, I, I want to be more successful so I, I, I can make more money and have better talent. And, and I want to get to the point where I can work less and make more money. I want to get to the top, work less, make more money. I want something deeper in my career. I want something better. Maybe it's your faith. You're like, man, I want to experience Jesus fully. I, I want to go in. I want to see what he has to offer my life. I want something deeper. I don't want surface level. I want something better. Because we know this, that in life, the deep end is always better. The slide was better. The cute girls were there, right? The diving board was better. The deep end of life is better. When your marriage is, are built on going deep and honoring each other and loving each other, it's better. As a parent, when you learn to go to the deep end of parenting and learn how to parent your child, it's better. Your relationships are better. Your career is better. And your faith, the deep end. Now, I'm not just talking about knowing stuff, right? But the deep end, where you're experiencing fully what Jesus has for you. You're fully knowing who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. It will always be better. Now, here's why I love Revolution. We got two services with a bunch of people, and in this church, unlike other churches at times, we have people who are, are all different walks of life. And so when you come through these doors, there are some of you who are, who are here today. You don't want to be here, right? But you're here. Some cute girl, some cute guy brought you. Your mom and dad brought you. You're here. And I'm going to tell you this. You got nothing better to do for the next 25 minutes. You might as well listen to me, right? Come on now, all right? But you're here. And then some of you are like, hey, I'm starting this journey. I, I don't know what I believe yet. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I'm trying to figure it out. Then some of you are like, hey, I, I'm just kind of in the middle. Like, I've been doing this for a little while, but I, I love what I'm seeing. I love what God's doing in my life. And then some of you are like, hey, I'm in the deep end. Like, I, I'm all in. I'm giving everything. I'm doing as much as I can. And I, I'm going to experience what God has for me. I, I've been doing this. I want to help people learn. Right? We're all over the spectrum when it comes to faith. But what you'll find is no matter where you're at, the deep is always better. And as we end this series, here's what my desire is. As a community, we have the desire to leave the shallows of life and live in the deep. And we're going to talk about what this means to live in the deep. Because if we don't live in the deep, if we just stay in the shallows, you know what we'll do? We'll say, oh, that was a really cute series. That was a really cute moment. That was a really great moment. And then five years from now, you'll still be in the, in the shallow end with the floaties not experiencing what God has for you. So we're going to leave the shallows. Everybody say that. Leave the shallows. Live in the deep. There we go. And so what I want to do is I want to take you to an ancient letter. 
It's a letter called Hebrews. We don't know who wrote this letter. We, we don't know the author for sure. I believe it's Paul. But someone wrote this letter, and it's in the Bible. And it's one of the deepest and most theological letters or books in all the Bible. And one of the, the overarching themes in this book is that Jesus is greater. That Jesus is greater than anything in this life. Jesus is greater than anything in this world. But in the middle of it, in chapter 5, we have this author, and he's writing to maybe in the context, a group of Christians, a group of Jesus followers who have been going to church for a while. And he writes these words, and I want you to think about this. Many times when you would get a letter, not all of them could read. So the letter would maybe be read out publicly in front of the church. So I want you to imagine that you receive these words. And here's the context of these words. He's writing to Jesus followers who should know more about their faith than they do, should know more about Jesus, who, have sh who should have left the shallows already, but they have it, and they're living in the shallows. And in verse 12, chapter 5 of the book of Hebrews, it says this. He's like, you've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. You've been going to church long enough. You've been hearing about Jesus long enough. Now you should be teaching others. But instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's words. He's like, you've been in the shallows for so long now. You should be out of there teaching other people this, but you don't. You're not. You need reminded of this constantly. You're like babies. And anybody, any, anytime anybody calls you a baby, like, doesn't that just rile you up? Like, that's fighting words. They call me a baby. Like, you don't know me, bro, right? But he's like, you're like babies who need milk, cannot eat solid food. So he's kind of drawing this imagery of, of a baby eating a, out of a bottle. And he says, for, some, for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. That's important. Doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food, so the good stuff, the steaks, or in my case, the pizza rolls, the solid food is for those who are mature, who through training or who through the process have the skill to recognize, recognize what? The difference between right and and wrong. Like, wouldn't you like getting that letter? That'd be like really encouraging. Like, hey, thanks for inviting me to church today. Call you a bunch of babies and leave, right? So, so here's what the author is saying. Like, listen, you guys should be farther along than you are right now, but you're not. You, you haven't gone through the process. You're still in the shallow end. So how do we read those words? Now we can read those words, and for some people, maybe this is exactly what they need to hear. But here's how I want to read these words. I want to read these words today as a warning. A warning of what happens when we're just a group of people who never leave the shallows. When we're just a group of people who just live with our floaties on. Who love Jesus but don't really change how we live. Who never really move from one end to the other. So I want to read it as a warning. And not like one of those warnings that you see and you kind of ignore. Like, so I, I found a couple of warnings this week that like we just ignore. Pepper spray warning. May irritate your eyes. Like, duh. Okay, you're going to read right over that. Or how about this one? Harmful if swallowed. I'm like, yeah, tell the fish that, man. Like a bass. Like, yeah, harmful if swallowed. We kind of ignore those because they're obvious. But here's some that we shouldn't ignore. Rip currents. We'll just stay on the theme of swimming, right? It says, watch out, you can be swept out to sea and drown. If in doubt, don't go out. I know people who have died from this. Or how about seatbelt warnings? Seatbelts must be worn while operating machine. Seatbelts save lives. So as we read this, I want to read it as a seriousness. Like, man, if, if we don't take these words and, and learn from them, maybe 20 years from now, 30 years from now, someone's writing a letter about revolution. Yeah, they're the church. I just never really got it. They're the church that could have done amazing things, but just never really matured. So we're going to read this as a warning. Like, we don't want to be them. Because there's a warning in verse 14. Here it is. Again, it says, Solid food is for those who are mature. So the heavy stuff is for those who are mature, who through, have, who through training have the skill to recognize, and this is really important, the difference between what? Right and wrong. Here's why that's so important. God has a set standard of how he calls each of us to live. All right, you can call them lists of rules. I don't call them lists of rules. But he has set standards of how we're to live. And the, the, these things that when we apply to our life, they make our life better. They make our relationship with Jesus better. They make everything better. Our marriages, our parenting, everything. 
But there's also a, a way that the world says to live, that culture says to live, that the enemy says to live. And so there is a, a right, wrong, there is a right way to live and a wrong way to live. There are right teachings and false teachings and, and good teachings and bad teachings. There's the things of God and things not from God. He's like, if you never mature, if you never leave the shallows, you don't have the skill, you don't have the knowledge, the ability to recognize the difference between right and wrong. He's like, you're not going to know what's really from God or what's not from God. But also, there's a bigger warning, not just right and wrong. If you're not taking the necessary steps towards the deep, you're settling for a lesser life. What, what do you mean I'm settling for a lesser life? We've already agreed that the deep end of life is better. When you're making, when the deep end of your career, the deep end of your marriage, the deep end of your friendships, your relationships, is better because you experience more. When it comes to our faith in the deep end, again, it's not knowledge transforming. We're not transferring knowledge. But in the deep end, when you're experiencing who Jesus is fully, you're living the life that he has called you to, because I believe he has, he's given you a purpose. That's what, that's what living in the deep means. It's knowing him, experiencing him, allowing him to change you and shape you. When you're not doing that, you're settling for a lesser life. Because you're not experiencing all that Jesus has to offer. Now, here, here's, I, I do have to say this. Now, maybe you're here today, you know, hey, listen, Nathan, I'm brand new. I'm taking milk. So I want you to notice, did he say, and what did he say? Did he say it's bad to have milk? No. How, how about this? How many of you love to drink milk just in general? I don't trust any of you, man. I, don't, I can't drink milk at all. So I, I got to imagine it's chocolate milk, okay? It's chocolate milk in my bottle. But he doesn't say, hey, don't drink milk. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say you should never drink milk. He doesn't say that. So let's not put words in his mouth. Here's what he said, the author's saying. He's like, there's a time to drink milk. There is. Because when you're drinking the milk in, in the shallows, you're learning the foundation. You're learning, hey, what, who's Jesus, who is Jesus? You're learning what it means to live like him. Oh, I'm starting to read my, my Bible app. I'm starting to pray. I might start going to church for the first time. It's kind of laying the foundation. There's nothing wrong with milk. Nothing wrong at all. It doesn't taste very good, I don't think. But there's nothing wrong with milk. The milk is good. We all need to be there. But he's like, there's something that happens. Because in the milk, you're, you're getting knowledge. You're getting information. You're, you're growing in a relationship. And the more you know, the more you should grow. Or the more milk you take in, if we're following the illustration of a baby, the more you'll grow physically. As adults, you know this. The more, as kids, the more food you eat, you kind of go this way. As adults, the more food you eat, you kind of go this way, right? We get that, right? We understand that the more you know, the more you should grow. And so here's what I'm ple pleading to you. It's like, don't settle for the shallows. Don't just settle for the glimpse. Don't just settle for a little bit of what Jesus has for you when you can fully experience living in the deep. Because God's desire for you isn't to live in the shallows of your marriage, of your parenting, but most of all in your faith and your relationship with him. When you can live in the deep. Don't settle for shallow. You can live in the deep. And so what he's saying, he's like, hey, he's telling his audience, grow up. Grow up. Be mature. Act your age. You guys ever know someone who doesn't act their age? And your hands are like, come on now. Like, or that guy or girl who lives like in their glory days? Anybody? Okay. All right. Jenny, don't be elbowing Mike here. Come on now. It's church. When I think of that, someone who doesn't act their age or never grows up past their glory days, here's what I think about. Anybody know who this is? Come on. Uncle Rico, man. We got some Uncle Ricos in here. I know we do. I know we do. If my wife was in here, she'd call me Uncle Rico. But Uncle Rico is from one of the, I don't know what to call it, but he's from the movie Napoleon Dynamite. Anybody ever seen that movie, right? Okay. Man, I think of all of you differently now, right? Napoleon Dynamite. Uncle Rico, a crazy character. His whole life is built on that he never got put in the game, and they would have put him in the game, they would have won state. So Uncle Rico lives his life with the same hairstyle, the same clothing, and, and he even videotapes himself throwing footballs, trying to try out for NFL teams. He lives in his glory days. 
Though, I would take this van nowadays. This is pretty cool. I travel the country in that van. Whitney wouldn't have it, but that's pretty sweet, right? But Uncle Rico, he's funny because he's like, like, you just never grew up. And so when we, when we look at people like that, like, man, hey, dude, you're, you're, you're 50 now. Stop acting 25 or stop, you know, live, wearing your high school jacket, right? Come on now. But Uncle Rico never grew up. And the Hebrew author is saying, listen, you've never grown up. You've never took in that next step. You look like a bunch of Uncle Ricos, man. And to that, you're like, excuse me? No, right. It's like, you got to grow up. And so here, here's another encouragement. Wherever you're at, wherever that is, live up to your stage of faith. And, and I can't answer where you should be, but you can. So you got to ask this question. I'm going to ask it to you. Are you in the right stage spiritually? What I mean by that is, can you look at your life? If you were looking at your, your faith life, can, can you look at your faith and say, listen, I'm not perfect. And none of this is perfection. Perfection is not the standard. But pro progression is. So can I look at my faith and say, you know what? I can see where I was five years ago. And man, I haven't come very, very far. But I've moved a little bit. But I can look where I was five months ago. And how I was lost and, and I needed Jesus and I had no one. And everybody turned on me. I still don't got it figured out. But I'm not in that pit where I was. Or hey, I've I, I, I been doing this for a long time. I'm not perfect. But I'm better than who I was 20 years ago. Or, you say, and this has happened, especially if you've been a Christian for 15, 20, 25, 30 years, it gets easy. Man, I've been in the same spot of my faith that I've been in a long time. I can't, take, I can't tell you the last time I took a risk. I can't tell you the last time I've grown. I, I'm just here. And for some of you, you might be, hey, I literally sat in the same chair since this building opened, right? It's got my name on it. When I die one day, they're going to put a golden plaque on this chair for me. Are you in the right stage spiritually? And I can't answer that for you. You can. God knows where you should be. And for some people, this process looks different. But for some people, there's this moment where, you know, God steps in their life, and there's an automatic change. Boom. They change drastically. And then they're like, hey, I'm heading this direction. For some of us, it's just a, a, a direction of obedience, a, a kind of continually just step after step. But are you in the right stage spiritually? Because this church that he was talking to, they're not there. And he says, I want to, he says earlier, he says, I want to tell you so much more. God has so much more planned for you, but you can't understand yet because you're not where you need to be. And he says this phrase, he's like, you're like babies who need milk and can't eat solid food. He's like, you're adults who can't eat solid food. So I got my, I got my daughter's bottle up here with me. This is not mine, right? I just want you to imagine, first of all, I hate these things because they, they put them, the, screw on the bottom and the top like I get this thing leaking all over me all the time but anyways I want you to imagine that you see me and everywhere I go I'm just drinking out of this bottle right you see me working out in the gym just drinking this bottle what are you gonna think about me you're gonna think dude that guy is a freak like no hey we're not going back to revolution ever again like they're weird but hey you invite me over for dinner like hey we're having tacos like no no bro I got my bottle like we ain't eating tacos I got this. It looks weird, doesn't it? Like, you know it would be weird. I don't want to... Let me just get a little personal. And we know it's weird every area of our life. We don't accept it in our marriages. We don't accept it in our relationship. We, don't ex we definitely don't accept it in our food, right? If you came to my house, I gave you a bunch of bottles. You're like, hey, I'm out. Like, I'm out. That's it. But why do we settle for it in our faith? Why do we settle for it? That's what the author's asking. Like, I'm at this stage in my life in my house where we're, we're, we're off this now. We're on the solids, and that means a lot of things change. Diapers change. Puke changes. It's real now. It's okay. 
But I was like, Natalie, you want to get, she didn't want to get off this bottle. I'm like, hey, you got to get off this bottle. Like, there's something called Hidden Valley Ranch. Like, it's going to change your life. I'm serious. It may be manna from heaven. I'm not convinced it's not, right? There's pizza rolls. There's pizza. Like, you don't want formula. You don't want milk. Well, yeah, she did, didn't she? She wanted it. And she cried for a long time. I'm going to be honest. There's some days I just, hey, Whitney, turn around. I'm just going to give her the bottle back because this, this is not working out. I want to sleep sometime this century. But he's like, listen. You're settling for less. There, there's got to be a progression here. Again, it's not perfection. We're not saying there's got to be any perfection, but there's got to be a progression here. And the progression is, there, you can name it a bunch of things, but we're just going to call it spiritual maturity. And notice what I said about spiritual maturity. It's the process of God growing and stretching you to become more like Jesus. Nowhere do I say, hey, it's knowing everything, having all the facts, being able to read Greek and Hebrew. But I just said, hey, it's the process of God growing you and stretching you to become more like Jesus. It's living in the deep end and allow God to chisel your life, allowing God to, to, to mold you, learning more about God through his word, learning more about God through prayer, but that's spiritual maturity and there needs to be this progression. So what I want to end this series with is like, listen, how do we stay a community of one heart? What is this progression? There's, and that's really hard to do because there's no streamlined process. I can't say, hey, follow these except this 10-step this plan, and you're going to be exactly where you need to be. Because I can't do that because it doesn't work that way. There's no streamlined process. At the end of the day, what often you have to realize is like, it's nobody else's responsibility to take you off the bottle. Right? Now, we're going to help you, but there's, a, there's something, there comes a point where like, hey, you know what? I want to experience fully what God has for me, and I want to move from this. And there's this process that they, they put in place here years ago before I got here. And I want to just talk about this because we're going to talk about this much more often. You're going to see it all the time. Any, any first steps that you're going to have through revolution is going to go through this process. And again, it's not perfect, but I want to I tell you about it a little bit. Maybe you know this, and if you know this, just stick with me here. But there's a process that we call the three C's. And the three C's, it's kind of our discipleship process. But here's what I believe, that growth only comes with a process. And if if you're going to grow in your faith, it doesn't happen by accident. You can experience God, but God's going to ask you to grow. God's going to ask you to take steps. God's going to ask you to mature in your faith. So here's the process. It's three C's. That we're, we do them with these arrows. So if you've ever been around here, you're like, what do these arrows mean? I'm going to tell you right now. So here's the first one. Anybody know what this means? Celebrate, right? I knew you guys knew it. Everybody say celebrate. 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 And I love celebrate because celebrate is the first step. This, is the, this to me is the most exciting step. This is what we need to get right all the time. Celebrate is amazing, right? And, and celebrate is this idea that we're ce celebrating what God did up here with us down here. We're, we're celebrating that God wants a relationship with us. We're celebrating that God sent Jesus to us. We're celebrating that God says you matter, you have a purpose. So we're going to celebrate. And then this is celebrate phase or the celebrate step where you're just learning so there's some steps that we encourage people to take first step is baptism so many times we think baptism is the the end game like no no that's the first step of experience this new life god has for you so baptism they say god I, i'm dying to my old life and i want to step into this new life that you have for me and we're going to celebrate what god wants to do through your life and so i think of what paul wrote in philippians why he was in house arrest he says rejoice in the lord always i will say it again rejoice so you're celebrating, you're learning. So in this first step of celebrating, it's baptism, it's learning. It's where people read their Bible for the first time. It's where people start to pray. It's where you start to maybe attend church. And then you start to worship. Worship is a celebration. We're celebrating what God has done. We're giving God his worship and we're worshiping him. It's not just songs though. It's also by how we, we live. So here you start to see some change in your life. You're like, God, I'm going to honor you with my life, with my mind, with my heart, with my soul, with my marriage, with my parenting, with my words. I'm going to celebrate everything you've done in my life, and I'm going to give my life to you. So we're celebrating. We're rejoicing in what God has done. And here's what we're also doing. We're celebrating what God has done in other people's lives. And that's what's so cool. Like, we're not just going to say, hey, God's working in me. No, we see what God's doing in you. We see what God's doing in you. We see what God's doing here. So we're celebrating. And then we're connecting. Man, if I could pick one area, if I could get a, just a little preachy, one area where Satan attacks more in my lifetime, in my generation, than any other area is this connect aspect. Where he tries to convince us that connecting to other people who follow Jesus does not matter. But it does. 
And so many of us would not be here without connecting not only to Jesus, but connecting with people who were farther along or connecting to people who loved us enough to tell us about who Jesus is and help us grow in our faith. Right? So many of us. But connecting is this idea where I'm connecting with people around me. And so in a world where we don't connect, uh, you're connecting with the people around you. So one way to gauge your connection is really easy. Do I know the people I'm sitting next to? Do I just come here and then rush back out? Listen, we want you here, but man, I, there's so much more to offer when you connect. Am I involved in a life group? Do I serve at, at times? Am I reaching out to people who I know who are hurting in this community, who've lost loved ones in this community? And part of connecting, it, why it's so important is, you know, there, there's also this reality that there's, there's people in this room who need you, who are farther along maybe in their faith than you are, that you need. And if you're farther along than somebody, man, you, you should be helping them move to the deep end, connecting with them. And then if you're not farther along, you should find someone who you think may be farther along and say, listen, I don't know you. You may think I'm weird, but I want to connect with you because I see your marriage. I see how you parent. I see your faith. I want to be, whatever you got, I want to experience it. I want to connect with you. And that's really what this series has been about. Because here's the key verse. All the believers were one in heart and one in mind. And that's really easy to say. It's really easy to say, hey, we're a community that loves people. It's really easy to say, hey, we're a, we're a family. It's really easy to say we're better together. But it's a lot harder to actually put it in practice. And I'll always live by this. If we can't love each other, I don't think we're going to be real good at loving people out there. That's just me. If we can't connect with each other, I think it's going to be hard to connect with people out there. Connecting is one of the steps. One of the things Jesus did he got disciples. He trained them. He taught them. And even in those, those 12, he got closer to three. So it's, it's celebrating. It's connecting. Because in this connecting phase, you're, again, you're reading your Bible. You're connecting with other believers. You're learning more about your faith. You're maturing. And then there's the last aspect, the last th C. Contribute. Everybody say contribute. Contribute. And this is where it gets real. This is when you realize, hey, God has given me these abilities, these talents, to contribute to his mission, to his calling, to, hit, to bring heaven down here, to bring God's kingdom here on earth, to live like Jesus. So when I talk about deep, I, I don't want you to leave today thinking I'm talking about anything else other than this. Do not merely listen to the words. Don't just get the information. And so deceive yourself. Do what it says. You want to live in the deep end? Apply what God has called you to do to your life and contribute to the mission. Contribute to his church revolution. And so part of contributing is like, listen, am I serving? I know, I know, I know, I know. I, we talk about serving a lot, but the reason we talk about that is because that's how God works in our lives so often. But are you, are, are you contributing to something here at the church? Are you contributing to a mission? Uh, the kids ministry, the worship ministry, right? The, the lobby ministry, the coffee hour, the, all these other things. Are, are you contributing? Have you moved from just benefiting from the mission to helping carry the mission forward? Not just at church. Have you moved from just benefiting from what Jesus has done for you to helping move his mission here on earth forward? Again, in this process, you're going to grow. You're going to read your Bible. You're going to study. You're going to be part of life groups. You're going to go to church. But you're saying, Jesus, here's my, God, here's my life. Jesus, here's my life. Here's my talents. Do with my life what you want to do so I can contribute to what you're trying to do here. Again, I know this isn't a perfect process. But I, I think we should look at these three C's and say, well, where am I? Am I just finding Jesus? Well, then I'm going to celebrate. I'm in the celebrate stage. Have I found community? Have I connected, right? Have you connected? Because that might be your next step. Because I'm going to find community. I'm going to connect. And after I celebrate and connect, God's going to be working my life so much. I'm going to take off the floaties. I'm going to drift towards the shallow, uh, the deep end. And I'm going to live like him. And I'm going to contribute to his mission. And here's why this is so important to me. And I mean this with all sincerity. I want the best for your life. 
That's why I got in the ministry, for the best, the best, the best for your life. But what I mean by that is I want you to fully experience what God wants to do in your story. And I mean that sincerely. I, want, I, want to, I hope that we see amazing things, God, God doing amazing things in your life. But I know that unless we drift and swim towards the deep end, we'll never fully experience what God has for us, what God wants to do through in his kingdom, in his mission. And when you're at your best, it's in the deep end. When I'm at my best is when I'm in the deep end. And when you're at your best and I'm at my best and we're contributing together, the church is at its best. And when the church is at its best, God works in this world in miraculous, amazing ways. But so often, we just stay in the shallow and we never get to where God wants to call us because it comes with a process. And this whole series, we've been talking about this process. But my encouragement is like, let's be a church that says, you know what? God has so much more to offer than the shallows. It was fun while it lasted, but we're drifting to the deep and we're not gonna just drift there. We're gonna live there because we know God is gonna do something through a movement that we call revolution. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for who you are. We're so thankful that you wanna partner with us that you want to work in our lives. We are broken and imperfect, God, and, uh, but we're here to worship you. Father, I, I pray we become a heart, a community that desires to leave the shallows and live in the deep. So God, here's my prayer for, on behalf of us. Use us, shape us, grow us, change us into who you want us to become so we can become the church that you have called us to be. So we can be the light in a dark world. We can be the salt in, in, in this community, in, in this culture, in this, this time, God. You have set us in this time, in this, this town, in this community, in these counties for a reason. God, let us experience the deep that you want to do in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.